I don't hear any hacking or coughing in the background. No, Jill's in the shower right now, and so uh, our viewers and listeners are going to hear her turn on her hair dryer in a little while. And for a, a, a wonderful wife with short hair, she really likes to dry her hair. So that, that'll be fun. Oh, yeah. Susan made a terrible mistake. We have a parishioner, a young girl, 22, 23, who is uh, going to cosmetology school to learn to mm -hmm. be a hairdresser. And the cosmetology, school, in, uh, Greece. the cosmetology school has, you know, they work on people, and it's the little, little girl, girly girly asked Susan to come so that she could do Susan's hair sure. and nails. Oh my God, she's not doing dental. <laughs> and it was really, really cheap. And next semester, let's hope she does better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she right. did Susan's nails, and they all, like, peeled off on the drive home and all that stuff. Uh, but, sure. So this week I want to show the audience what it's like to do a show. And so right. I was going to, I just pressed record already. And, uh, and he, 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 the Susan story is fine. And I thought we'd just do record all the way through. They can hear the three, two, ones. They can hear the, uh, the dropouts. And hopefully we do a, a one taker. But I think if we're nice and casual, it shouldn't be too much trouble. Now today's the 30th of November, uh, November yeah. and AU episode 460. 460. Okay. Um, and it's, it's uh, the, the, you know, Gavin always has some wonderful feast day. I can't think you, of that. If you can't figure out a feast day, that's not my problem. Um, I'm going to do the uh, viewer intro stuff. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Anglican War going on in Egypt. Uh, we're going to talk about the death of a missionary. And we'll give a primate's news update. Uh, if you could take some of the headroom under your camera. Up or down? Go the other way. Other way. Or the other. Put, uh, put the camera the, down. The. There you go. There you go. Okay, good. And, there we go. All right. Put the up there. Boom. All right, good. So that works really well. We both look about the same size. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. All right. We did our prayer. We did our pre-show. We're going to... The audience is blessed. They don't have to sit through a pre-show. One day we'll, have, we'll offer subscribers the, the chance to pay to watch the pre-show. Uh, let's do our sound check. One, two, be, three, four. What? Kevin, paying to watch the pre-show is like I'm going to the student hairdresser. It's just, <laughs> yes. in theory, it's a good idea. <laughs> it, it were, uh, it were, could go, I should do the hairdresser thing. I mean, the damage <laughs> could not be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, don't worry about it. You know, not a big deal. All right. Well, let's do the sound check. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Let me raise yours up a tad bit. You're a little soft and squishy. Any One, two, on three, four, five. Out. One, two, three, four, five. Ooh, nice deep voice. Any minutes. any luck on getting a sponsorship from cigarette commercial cigarettes or anything? <laughs> Marlboro. No. Yes, we have our DJ voice on. Late night. <laughs> <laughs> Billboards top twenty. Okay, let's have some sun. Let I can't even talk. So, uh, let's get the coffee ready. Okay, three, two, one. It's time for Anglican Unscripted again. Episode. Oh, I didn't check here. See, this is the stuff our audience never sees. 460. 321. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 460. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today's November 30th, 2018. 321. Okay, welcome to another show, the post Thanksgiving show. George, you, your pants fit? Yes, but I have to wear I've it's exciting, Kevin. It's it got down to the forties last night in Florida, so I get to break out my winter clothing. My <laughs> wife's gone around in a parka. I'm. Yes. Uh, it's in the mid. It's in the low seventies right now, so we're in a severe storm watch for uh, freezing over and everything. I get okay. to wear a chamois shirt and all that stuff. Well, the Thanksgiving right after is when the internet and shoppers and people like my wife and my sister-in-law go gaga over all the sales and all the deals. And I guess there's 
a Black Friday, there's something on Saturday, there's Cyber Monday, there's Donation Tuesday, and Anglican TV fits into all that, believe it or not. We are called Leftovers Friday. So after you bought all your presents and stuff on, on Saturday and, and, and Friday and did your deal, I got a deal on Amazon with a nice, nice knife set for our kitchen. It's time, and you gave money to the Red Cross and uh, GAFCON and uh, everyone else. If there's anything left over in your account, that goes to Anglican TV. Um, you didn't know that, did you? So please go to anglican.inc forward slash donate and take the remaining balance in your bank account and just transfer it over and uh, that should help our operations uh, for the next year i hope um let's move oh audience participation not just donation like this episode even though you don't like it share this episode even though you're embarrassed by us uh and i just looked up the viewers we have 30 percent of our viewers are subscribed 60 percent are not subscribed to the show Please subscribe so you get instantly notified when there's a new edition of Anglican Unscripted. It'll arrive in your email box. You go, oh, I don't want to watch. George, let's talk a little bit about the news. Um, you told me something I completely did not know in our pre-show uh, about the politics of Egypt. And I thought we could talk about it here a little bit. Uh, in most countries... A Lutheran is a Lutheran, and an Episcopalian is an Episcopalian, a uh, Catholic is a Catholic, and they are identified by the government equally. You're one of those crazy people, you're one of those crazy people, uh, oh, we control who's your bishop, no big deal. Uh, in Egypt, they look at evangelicals, and uh, a long time ago, somebody made a deal that we represent all evangelicals. Why don't you tell us the story? Well, the, the uh, kicker, if you will, or the point that we departure today at All Saints Cathedral in Cairo, the Diocese Gathered of Egypt, for a day of pr uh, for a day of discussion, and they've set aside two days in December of prayer and fasting, because the Presbyterian Church in Egypt is involved in a hostile takeover of the Anglican Diocese of Egypt. What am I talking about? How can you have a hostile takeover <laughs> of a diocese? <laughs> well, what's going on? Egypt, the government, Egypt is a government bureaucratic state. Always has been in the last, in the modern era. <clears throat> and the Diocese of Egypt started off as an English colonial plant. And up through the Second World War, the majority of its adherents were expatriate uh, Europeans. Beginning in the Second World War era, that began to become indigenous until at this point now it's almost entirely indigenous along with refugees from the Sudan and other parts of Africa. It's a growing, thriving, and under its Bishop of Near Nice, it's doing just great. Mm -hmm. Problem is the government. A number of years ago, the government uh, basically set a decree that all Protestants are going to be under the mantle of this, uh, it's called the PCE in English. It's, it's essentially the Presbyterian group. And so we've got the Coptic Orthodox, the Catholic, and we're going to slot you Anglicans into the PCE. Well, that was fine for government relations, but the PCE has an, a leader over the past few years who has taken it seriously, such that the Anglican Church in Ismailia, has been taken over by the Presbyterians because they can have the government enforce their edicts. So now we're in a position where if the Diocese of Egypt wants to bring in a, an, a foreigner to work, they have to send the paper to, paperwork to the government, to the government give them a, a visa. Well, the government's not going to accept a paperwork for the Diocese of Egypt. It has to come from the PCE. So the Diocese of Egypt is struggling to get out from under uh, the power grab of the Presbyterians. And their fears, they see their fears as being justified because a number of years ago there was a Pentecostal church of Egypt and its 20 churches, its ministers were all fired by the PCE, replaced by PCE men, and properties taken over by the PCE. So the Diocese of Egypt 
needs divine intervention. Uh, it needs God to basically speak in the ear of the president of Egypt, who basically says, well, can say, leave the Anglicans alone. But right, I, mean, I think and, the, I think the only but, solution here is for the president of it to make a decree. Yes. See, e Egypt is a bureaucratic state. In other words, 99 and 9 tenths of the, Egypt has 30 bureaucrats to do the job that one person could do in an afternoon. It's the state's the largest employer. And none of these people know the difference between an Anglican and an evangelical. In fact, uh, it's a constant mistake that we see in the press. Recently, remember, there was the murder of uh, a number of Coptic pilgrims on their way home from visiting a monastery on a pilgrimage. The press well, reported you said that. Coptic. I, I heard that one was an Anglican. One, and the uh, Associated Press reported that one of them, the driver, was an Anglican. Well, I contacted the Diocese of Egypt. They said, oh, no, no, he was an evangelical. But the in Arabic, the words evangelical and Anglican are so close that it's often Anglican is often translated as evangelical. And so for the average Egyptian rubber stamp bureaucrat, uh, he doesn't know the difference. And he thinks that, well, who does the government say is the head of the Protestants? This guy. And it's... <clears throat> It's well, it explains so much. People have wondered, well, why does Munir Anis, who is one of the stalwarts in the fight for the faith and one of the leaders of the Global South movement, why does he still give Justin Welby the time of day? Well, the Diocese of Egypt needs that Canterbury lifeline and link to be able to say we are not a part of a just an Egyptian Protestant church. We're part of a worldwide global family of reformed Catholic churches called the Anglican Communion. And so they need that link. They may, you know, at the primates meetings, Munir Nice was the strongest advocate for uh, uh, faithfulness. But he's got mm -hmm. to keep in goods with Justin Welby. And so... Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, Justin Welby provides street cred, or at least uh, Canterbury and the Church of England gives uh, the Anglicans in Egypt street cred. And here's the sad thing. The, the greatest existential threat to the Anglicans of Egypt is not ISIS, it's not Al-Qaeda, it's the Presbyterians. Um, uh, I mean, Satan just loves this sort of stuff. Yeah. It just how, loves this. How, you know, I would encourage our uh, audience to be prayer for all this because we have great biblical reference to what God does in Egypt through prayer and, uh, you know, yeah. Releasing plagues is, uh, is clearly something we could look forward to, I suppose. Who knows? But but the other thing I think we need to keep in mind is why has Munir and Nice gone out of his way to be friendly to South Carolina, to be friendly to American conservatives? Well, he's been there. He has been under the thumb of people trying to take his buildings and fire his clergy and take over his finances. So the plight of people in South Carolina and Fort Worth resonates with Munir and Nice. Because instead of 815 being the enemy, it's the Presbyterians. Oh, my. Yes. Well, let's move on to some other news that's uh, happened. It's not really Anglican news, yet it really, really is Anglican news. Um, there was a missionary who discovered that there's a lost tribe that has never heard of Jesus, and has, it's hostile, and they had their own island, and he thought he would uh, take it upon himself to bring Christ to that uh island nation as it were and reach this lost tribe and now, are we talking about greenwich village the island manhattan yes, uh, no. where oh, is this geez. lost tribe <laughs> yes uh this lost tribe is in an island uh you got i don't have a map in front of me but you, not america you gotta go way over and it's right off the uh the tip of what is that it's between india and burma it's called the andaman yeah. islands in the yeah, but, in, I'm trying in to the, think uh, of the city down there there is no city down poor. there. It's the middle of nowhere. No, no. It's, but, uh, well, whatever. Uh, the audience may have figured out. I've not finished my coffee yet. Hold on. Well, there. And so he goes and, yeah, he gets on his little canoe. He goes ashore. Surprise, surprise. Um, they get him with a couple arrows. They uh, drag him around the island, and uh, he's dead. And now we get all the critics of colonialism, all the critics of Christian missionaries, all the critics of evangelism, uh, come out and say, hey, we knew this was going to happen. And in seeing some of his early posts, this guy was going to die somewhere. 
okay, whether or not it was this island or whatever, he was this type of person who was adventurous, passionate, like you don't see a lot of evangelicals today. So I think he was going to be a martyr somewhere. And I thought we could talk about this because some of the complaints are like, you know, this was stupid. Well, in my recollection, uh, recog uh, in my remembrance of the Old Testament, did not 11 of the 12 disciples d have the same fate? Let me give you a little bit. Of, let, me, let me give our, some of yours a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. um, it's North Centralese Island in the Andaman, in the Andaman Islands uh, in the, between Burma and India. I'm if, put a map if our, so they can see if our re, if our readers remember the Sherlock Holmes mystery, the sign of four, I think it was one of the, it's the one where a uh, the sign of four, and one of the characters is a very very short uh, pygmy like man, a Negrito from the Andaman Islands. He's about a little over four feet tall. He uses a blowpipe to kill people. And he has come with the villain back to London to seek revenge on something. So that is the people of the Andaman Islands are about 10,000 years ago, came out of Africa. And they're of uh, African stock. Um, and they have been very hostile to every government that has uh, sought to colonize them. The British, the Japanese during World War II, the Indian government today, such that that some of the islands, the Indian government does not allow people to visit because the native tribes will try to kill them. It's not that they're unaware or a lost tribe, they're just a hostile tribe and a little fly speck of an island who kill foreigners. And this young man uh, trained at a missionary college to reach out to these people so that he could bring them the love, of, the love and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he got in his kayak, he landed on the beach, he made initial contact, went home, then went back the second day and was murdered on the beach with an arrow. And as you say, Kevin, there are some people saying, how horrible is it that he would disturb their lovely, peaceful tranquility of these happy natives who don't have cell phones ringing in the background or, or uh, the internet or bubble gum? Shouldn't they be happy in their ignorance? And I think the issue that you raise is that our mandate is to go reach the whole world for Jesus Christ. And this young man felt this call on God on his life. Yeah. Now, he could have, may have been more wise in the way he approached it, but I think his motives are the, those that we should congratulate. The motives were obviously uh, good and pure, um, but boy, you know, a, a little age brings a lot of wisdom. And uh, uh, I think if he were 45, and had a little wisdom under his belt, he would have done it differently. Not that he wouldn't have done it, but uh, I remember when I was a young Christian and uh, full of passion, uh, some of the stupid things I did. Uh, and so I'm not surprised when I read these types of stories, um, but when society says, hey, wait, um, this is the the very evil of Christendom. It's, it's, uh, this is the evil it's doing in China. This is the evil it's done in Europe and the evil it's done in the West is you have to keep telling people about Jesus. Can't you guys just get over it already? Um, <laughs> and for the West, a lot of it is over it. Um, and I understand, you know, you want to be blaming, uh, all the ills of the world on Christianity. The, there's nothing the press enjoys more. There's nothing mm. uh, college professors enjoy more uh, than to, to blame the ills of the world on Christianity. Uh, and other than the medical issue of bringing disease onto the shore, I don't see a lot of reason not to, uh, mm. to approach them with the gospel. It is the very call to reach the ends of the earth, uh, to go. And I think this young gentleman had received that call and went. Um, and oh no, it didn't work out right away. Well, we learned from our early apostles and disciples, it doesn't always work out right away. God redeems it at the end of the day. What I think our, what I hope our viewers take away from it is that there are groups, including friends of ours, Anglican Frontier Ministries, mm -hmm. that does evangelize the unreached peoples of the earth but they do it with training and 
a cultural sensitivity, and they're not looking to make people little Americans in the Andaman Islands. They're looking for them to be fully part of their culture and their world, but at the same time know the love of Jesus Christ. And cross-cultural, uh, cross, I mean, we have a, uh, uh, what do we call him, Father uh, Argo. Argo, yep. <laughs> Father Argo is in a part of the world where people kill Christian missionaries. And part of his, he just didn't walk in with a Brooks Brothers tropical weight suit and a bow tie and say, here I am, folks, I'm going to make you Americans. You know, he has uh, had to spend a great deal of time become culturally uh, aware of how he can reach these people and what their needs are. Uh, and how to speak to them in words that they will find and understand and open their hearts to Jesus Christ. And as we have heard time and again, where is the gospel moving most rapidly in the Muslim world? Because people right. like Father Argo, but he didn't just kayak in off the beach. So I think your point, Kevin, about maturity and wisdom needs to be taken seriously, but I applaud the motives. Uh, and I do. I mean, you take a Father Argo... And the missionaries I know within the Anglican Church are some of the most patient, long-term, you know, big-picture people I know. Um, they're not, they know that nothing is going to happen right away. And, you know, that's such a different terminology and understanding than we have when we're young Christians. When I was a young Christian, I had a much different worldview of the influence a that i should have by going out into the world and that's changed uh mostly because i'm old and bald now i don't want to go out into the world <laughs> the world can come to me now darn it all but uh you know i i've gained wisdom uh as you can hear mrs Coulson has turned on her hair dryer and she's drying her hair the this is one of the things we hope to be able to introduce to the people of north sentinel island uh yeah, the right. uh, hairdressers <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's an interesting topic and you know i don't think christians should run away from explaining why they do what they do if you're a missionary uh you know the world is like what's going on here well explain it um and it's a great opportunity to explain it not just run away from the topic George, we're coming up here in 22 minutes, but I did want to talk about the primates meeting. Not the primates meeting, Lambeth coming up. We got the firm dates that are coming up for 2020. and End of July, for first weekend of August 2020 mm -hmm. in Canterbury and in London. There's going to be new primates and new conservative primates, new primates of conservative provinces um, and new bishops and stuff like that. And I'm wondering... Is there more of a trend now that we're seeing in the press where they're deciding, hey, I'm going to go to Lambeth um, or I'm not going to go to Lambeth? There are about 25 stories here. Uh, one of them is, mm -hmm. does, it, is it, does it even matter anymore? Right. In other words, uh, to who's going to go and why are they going to go and why not? Uganda and Nigeria have announced that if certain conditions aren't met, they're not going to go. Justin Welby has not announced, but let it be known, that he's not inviting the ACNA. Therefore, Nigeria and Uganda won't go, because that's one of their conditions. But other conservative provinces, uh, we had a meeting in Toronto this past week of all the American provinces, from Canada down to Chile. <laughs> hey, this is live production here. <laughs> this is live production, folks. And the... Uh, Chile and South America will probably go as will the as will West Indies. They're going to elect a new primate, and it'll probably be a conservative in the mold of Drexel Gomez. Um, but there is the conservative global South movement, Gafcon movement. It's not of one mind on whether or not to go to Lambeth. Yeah. Um, well, you and I went to the last Lambeth, and you could tell as a body it was no longer a decision-making body of the church. Uh, it, it was, was not like 98. Right. 98 was the act, last actual, um, this is a movement body of decision makers within the Anglican Church. That time, that's gone. Uh, and I don't know, I think the only time that they will have it is when all the provinces agree to put all their people back in Lambeth. Uh, until then, it's just disjointed. 
And the, I hate to say this, but the, the theme of, uh, they've come up with these sort of anodyne themes about tell the world about Jesus and this and that. And that's so, frankly, it's silly and foolish and short-sighted. It's being planned by people who don't have the confidence of Christ and are looking to sort of bootstrap the those churches do have the confidence of Christ to hope somehow set the, the Church of England on fire and Church of Canada on fire again for Jesus Christ. Whereas the churches that are on fire for Christ, they don't not need to be told that. They need to be deal with the issues that are affecting the church, doctrine and discipline. So we're basically going to have a pep rally that not, uh, if everything unfolds, we're going to have pep rallies with rather silly Bible studies and presentations from rather anodyne or annoying teenagers. Um, it's just going to be a colossal, expensive waste of time. And folks, we're going to ask you to pay for us to go there to tell you it's a colossal, expensive waste of time. <sighs> but, but you know, the uh, there's a lack of rigor, intellectual rigor, moral rigor, uh, less lack of seriousness at the top of the communion. Um, it's being mimicked well, the it's, Catholic world too, but it's it. There's some disease going around among the top the top prelates that just make them irrelevant to the Christian faith. I think in a lot of ways the Anglican Communion leadership or the Church of England leadership is like Egyptian bureaucrats. You know, you have way too many to do the job needed to do, and they just think of ways to do stuff. This is this. We went to the last Lambeth. It was clearly planned by bureaucrats who were not communicating with each other, whose one desire was at the end of the day, we're not going to have the division. We're going to have Indaba. We're going to talk until everybody agrees. And what's that big tent over there? You know, it's like... <laughs> There was just this this misunderstanding of what leadership within a communion looks like. So there's no, as you, you're absolutely right, Kevin. The Archbishop of Canterbury has no conception of Christian leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, middle management of a corporate bureaucracy is now the is now the model uh, that is being peddled by Justin Welby, and it certainly has failed dramatically. It, the Church of England is an embarrassment in, I mean, it can't get, well, I'm sure it will get worse, but it has so fallen, so far, so fast in attendance and intellectual and moral rigor. It's a joke. And well, we do, the model we do that Justin Welby, yeah. the model that Justin Welby ha has brought to the Ang to Church of England is what he seeks to bring to the Anglican world. And uh, though I have always spoken in favor of going, because I believe that if you're at the table, you have the opportunity to negotiate something, I am very sympathetic to the people who say, why do I need to waste three weeks of my life? I can go on a vacation to England anytime I want. Why do I have to have bad food, stay in crappy college dormitories, hang out with some very annoying people? In Yeah. Well, Been there, the last time that I went to, no, there was a heat wave going on. Remember the heat wave last time we were there? Ah, oh, it was perfectly pleasant for me, but for you, you were fine. But for those of us in northern climate, I was dying. They had me at Kent University in some dorm off campus. No AC, brick building. All did was all day long was heat up in the sun, and I was in the upper floor. I'd go there and just I'd sweat it out. And that's my introduction to Lambeth. George, we've hit the end of the show. I want to remind people, viewers, uh, those who still have money left in their accounts, this is Leftover Friday. Please donate to Anglican TV. You do that by going to Anglican, uh, oh my gosh, anglican.inc forward slash donate. This has been a raw show. We wanted to show you the whole thing. Uh, now, a lot of you are podcast uh, listeners and aren't watching George. But if you look at George from the very beginning of the episode to now, you've seen that he's slouched. And normally I fix oh. that. I, I, I keep raising it up. I, I, I can raise up here. I'll, I'll show you what I can do. I can just raise this up. And <coughs> as he slouches, I just keep going and keep going and keep going. And that's just kind of the, the, the fun we have that happens behind the scenes that you guys never get to see because we're such professionals. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 460 of Anglican Unscripted.